So you're very welcome, everybody, to the next episode of the Paving the Way Home podcast. And delighted to be joined by a very special guest this week, Father Leon Pereira, a Dominican priest who is the chaplain to the English speaking pilgrims to Medjugorje, um, one of the largest pilgrimage sites in, in, in the world today. Uh, Father Leon, you're very welcome. Thank you, Thank Brian. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for, uh, for 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 giving me your time when I when I threw off off the email to you I was like oh look there there uh, there there might be no chance of this but uh, I was delighted to get the, uh, the the opportunity to to speak with you. Um, Father Leon, first of all, just before we go any further, can I ask you to lead us in an opening prayer? Of course. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, send us your Holy Spirit guide this conversation to reveal to us what you want us to know about you about your daughter your handmaiden mary the mother of your son and the spouse of your spirit lead us into a deeper love and veneration of her whom you have sent for our sake to bring jesus to us we ask this all in jesus name amen amen thank you father leon so, Father Leon, just to get a brief background uh, on you, you're obviously a Dominican priest um, uh, belonging to, I suppose, the province in the UK. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. Yeah. But uh, prior to that, you were actually uh, born and raised, is that correct, in Singapore? That's right. Yes. Very good. That's very where good. I grew up. In fact, today is Chinese New Year. So, Happy New Year. Oh, very good. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. And if you don't mind asking, Father Leon, how did you come to be the chaplain in Medjugorje? Oh, I was coming here as a, um, as a priest, you know, lead, well, I can't say leading groups. I was the groups led and brought me along as their chaplain, I suppose, you know, and that was back in 2009 onwards i started coming here more than once a year about three four five times a year maybe because i didn't really have very much to do i was a bit bored i was teaching at a seminary oscott which is great fantastic but i only taught there one semester and the rest of the time uh, well i also taught at blackfriars in oxford but i didn't have very much to do and these groups wanted a priest to come along with them so i came and, you know, from, from Ireland or from um, the UK, it's not so difficult to get here. Well, in, certainly not in those days. Maybe now a little bit more difficult with COVID going on. But uh, so I started coming here lots of times. Uh, and Father Kevin, my immediate predecessor, was retiring. So they were looking for a successor. And there was a rumor that there was a short list and you had to put your name on it. You know, and I was asked to put my name down. And I thought, what's the point, you know, because um, I've never won anything in my life, you know, any sort of lucky draw. <laughs> so I, I didn't. I didn't put my name down. <laughs> and uh, the Franciscans later told me, I don't know if it's true or not, but they, maybe they're joking. But they said that everyone who put their name down was clearly unsuitable. So they ignored them. Um, and then the very next day, 13th of May, uh, this is five years ago, six years ago. Father Marinko, who's the parish priest here, he saw me in the street. I was, there was a group of Dominicans from Zagreb. I was just following them and talking to them. And he saw me and I clearly don't look like I'm from Zagreb. And he said, Father, you, you come here many times, yes. And I said, yes, yeah. I'm sorry, I shouldn't do the accent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, I do. And uh, he said, good you come now come with me and he took me up into the office and i was so excited because it's the old place where the apparitions used to take place you know the old uh, parish house and uh, i'd never been inside before i was and he just asked me a few questions um like what i thought was good about medjugorje what i thought medjugorje needed uh, what languages i spoke etc and then you know he he basically took me out of the office he said good you go now go <laughs> so, so i left and a couple of hours after that i had a phone call from the curate saying oh father marinko says come now and i said for what and he said come live here and that's when i realized that was a job interview <laughs> and uh, oh wow he was satisfied yeah so that that and i thought it would never happen because i had to go back to my provincial tell him and 
provincial council. And of course, then the Croatian Dominicans, this is their territory. You know, I need their permission. Um, and of course, the local bishop as well. So, you know, it was, I didn't think it was ever going to happen. So it was beyond my wildest dreams, really. I didn't dare dream or hope about it. Even after I had the, the offer that was in May 2015, it, uh, it didn't sink in for a while. And it didn't arrive here till September. That's when all the permissions came through and I finally arrived. That's fantastic. And uh, no, it's wonderful because look, I've been out to Medjugorje plenty of times myself as well and uh, had the uh, opportunity, the, the pleasure to meet you in person once. Um, so it was uh, fantastic because we're, uh, we're so used to Father Kevin for years as well, who was absolutely fantastic. And then to, um, and so used to uh, the strong American accent and then <laughs> I remember my first time out there and this almost posh British accent. I was like, whoa, who's this? <laughs> Very good. Excellent. No, it's, uh, it, it, it's wonderful to have you. Um, it costs a lot of expensive education to give me this accent. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. So just before we, we progress, um, like at the moment, you know, whenever the, the subject or the topic of Medjugorje comes up in conversation, um among catholics of all different times you've 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 some pro you've some against you've all this at this moment of the time as we're recording this what is the church's current stance on medjugorje mm. really the church's stance has not changed since 1991 okay at that time the yugoslav bishops conference held a meeting in the um town of Zadar on the coast. So uh, this became known as the Declaration of Zadar, which is where they said, we do not have enough information to judge these apparitions as uh, worthy of belief, uh, and neither did they condemn it. You know, there the, are the three categories. Um, this is um, in Latin. I can't, I can't translate it easily into English. Okay. Constat de supernaturalitate, which means this is um, uh, uh, consonant with the, this has signs of being supernatural in origin. Okay. And then there's the opposite one is uh, constat de non supernaturalitate, which is this is definitely not supernatural. And then the, there's a middle cate category, non constat de supernaturalitate, which means undecided, basically. Okay. And that's the category they went for. Okay. Um, and then the war broke out here. And the Yugoslavia stopped existing, so and also the Yugoslav Bishops' Conference stopped existing. And the Vatican clarified much later on that um, the duty had fallen to the Bosnian and Herzegovinian Bishops' Conference to rule on this. And there's only three bishops here, I think, or maybe five, with the, counting the auxiliaries. And uh, they did not make any further pronouncements as a body together. So basically, Medjugorje was just in a limbo. It was the church had left it open. And, and the only major change was um, when the when Pope Francis sent uh, his apostolic uh, legate, uh, sorry, what is his name? Apostolic visitator. That's the official title. Archbishop Henrik Hoser, who's Polish, sent him here. And um, the major change was that before, prior to that, you could come here on private pilgrimages, uh, but priests and bishops were not allowed to organize these pilgrimages or call them pilgrimages. They could come along to accompany their people, but they weren't to make this place look as though it was definitely recognized and authorized. But the change that the Holy Father has made is that now bishops and priests can officially organize pilgrimages and come here. This is not giving Medjugorje recognition. It's just, you know, they can come here officially, etc., because part of the process of um, discerning if, if a shrine is authentic, um, if apparitions are deemed to be deemed credible, is to allow people to go there and see what effect it has on their lives. You know, so for Lourdes and Fatima, for example, when they were approved, one of the reasons given there by the, the, the local bishop of both places um, was people coming there and being converted and showing signs uh, that something supernatural was taking place, was continuing to take place, and therefore probably had taken place when uh, the apparitions were reported. That's amazing. And so today, um, 
I guess we're going to talk very much uh, more so on uh, devotion to Our Lady. And I suppose one of the reasons I wanted to contact you and speak about this is, look, we we all know as as particularly in recent years are going by, the world and world is becoming a a crazier place, so to speak. And um, you know, this is this is very much the the time of the uh, of of the Immaculate Heart and and that, but. So often in conversation, when Our Lady is is brought up, um, you know, people might be talking about, you know, the importance of devotion to Our Lady or, or, or consecration to Our Lady, and you sometimes you might have the the question as, but like, why why come to Our Lady when you can go directly to Jesus? Um, and it's look, it's a it, it's an honest and, and, and a good question. Um, can I put you on the spot and ask you to answer that? You can indeed. Um, I don't know if you're taking words out of my own mouth, but I, I know there are different talks given by me all over the internet. I, I don't have any control of this, but um, <laughs> in some of them I have said that when I was a teenager, I said exactly that. Why do we have to go through Mary? Why can't we go directly to Jesus? Because when I was, um, how old was I now? 17. I fell in with a group of evangelicals, you know, and I, I, I still have a great deal of fondness for that style of worship and the, and that sort of evangelical spirit, um, you know, how they are. They, they kind of hold themselves accountable to each other to a great extent. I wish we had more of that in the Catholic Church. But when I was with them, I had all these strange ideas. You know, I didn't know, I didn't understand why we believed in purgatory. Um, forget about indulgences <laughs> and, and and of course now i'm a huge fan of indulgences actually but um and in the place of our lady i had no place for our lady in my life at that time when i was about 17. i grew up in a pious catholic family so i knew how to pray the rosary we prayed it every day every night it, you know all through my childhood but yeah you know, when i was 17 that was my rebellion i suppose but it was a rebellion for jesus I thought somehow that she distracted us from from Jesus. And now when I think about it, it's just a, such a crazy idea to have. It's a bit like saying you can't love your dad, you can't love your mom because it'll make you love your dad less. Yeah. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and um, how did I overcome these difficulties? I think, well, actually it was Medjugorje. It was Medjugorje. I, it was in 1988, the end of the Marian year. Now, you're too young to remember this, I'm sure. <laughs> Pope John Paul had <laughs> declared a Marian year. It was, you know, the 2000th anniversary of Our Lady's birth. So from 1987 to 88. And 88, it finished on August 15th. Uh, and there was this enormous rally in one of the stadiums in Singapore. And uh, my mother dragged me to it. I told her, I don't believe in Our Lady. And she said, I don't care. She believes in you and you're going. So, so I got dragged to it. And also my Protestant friends told me, in fairness, they said, remember the fourth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. So I went and um, they told my Protestant friends told me, pray to God and ask him to reveal to you the whole truth about Mary. So I did. And in that moment when I prayed at this rally with all these, there were, you know, 100,000 Catholics praying the rosary. And I, I, I looked at them thinking, oh, you superstitious lot, you know, you could be going directly to Jesus. You know, you know that kind of smugness <laughs> that only the really young can have, <laughs> especially if you're a young evangelical. There's nothing quite as smug as that, I suppose. That was me. And I looked around and I thought, oh, these, uh, these poor, poor people, deluded. Uh, and, uh, but in that moment, when I said that prayer, I felt in my heart that God had said, if only you knew. <laughs> that frightened me a little bit. It shook me. And that was August. And by November, um, I'd fully come back to my faith properly and to the church, the sacraments, and to Our Lady, of course, as well. And all because of Medjugorje. But this Protestant friend, um, Methodist, he took me to a, a talk on Med Medjugorje. And that really began my conversion back to truth and to joy that's amazing that's a it's a fantastic testimony in, in that and you mentioned there pope john paul ii 
uh, mm -hmm. and the intermarrying year. And of course, for those of us who are very familiar with his papacy, he had his famous motto, Totus Tus Maria, totally yours, Mary. So he was very much, uh, he was very much a pope and a, and a voice that was calling on the world to come to Jesus through Mary. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, it is a strange thing. I, because I grew up in that era, you know, okay, I, I think my earliest memories, well, the first time I came across the word Pope was when Pope John Paul I died. Uh, no, sorry, when Paul VI died. Um, and my brother and sister were sent home from school early. They went, you know, they went to Catholic schools and they sent home and everyone was in shock and they all said, oh, the Pope's died and everyone looked very somber. And I said, what's the Pope? And my mother looked at me like I was a, a heathen pagan child. <laughs> she was horrified, you know, so she explained that it was something like a bishop, but bigger. And I thought, oh, there's something bigger than a bishop. You know, I, I didn't know there's anything higher than that. And uh, and then, the, you know, 30 days later, John Paul I died. Um, and then I thought popes died every month. So... <laughs> 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 but you know, and then and then it was John Paul in the mass. We always said John Paul's name. You know, our, our Pope John Paul, our Bishop Gregory. You know, in Singapore in that time, that those were the only names I remember hearing for years and years and years. And I, I think I was too young. You know, the John Paul's theology of the body, his discourses that he gave, we never heard it. Didn't hear that. I, I would have been too young anyway. But. Uh, the internet didn't exist. I don't think Catholic newspapers reported these things that faithfully in those days. Um, I don't know what they had actually in them. I'm not sure. <laughs> I should look up in the archives. Um, so it all it sort of bypassed us, really. So I, I remember when when John Paul died. I was living in Rome at the time, and uh, I was interviewed by XT3 Christ in the Third Millennium. And they asked me, they said, do you consider yourself a John Paul II generation Catholic? And I'd never even thought about it. And I said, no, not really. You know, I mean, I wasn't, he just, because we didn't know about what he was actually teaching, it didn't filter down to us. Um, and really, my, I said to her, uh, I was more influenced by Cardinal Ratzinger. You know, I um, read his, uh, his introduction to Christianity um, when I was about 19. I didn't understand a word, but <laughs> I thought I should read a book like this. <laughs> I tried to read it, you know, and then later on, I, I mean, I read it again and again, and later I thought this is, I still didn't understand it, but I knew it was something beautiful. And I was very much influenced by uh, Cardinal Ratzinger. He was at the time, he hadn't been elected Pope yet, you know, but, but and looking back, I see all the great beauty uh, and, and the wonders that John Paul did for us. Um, and I kind of feel like I wish I had uh, benefited a bit more from all this while he was still alive, you know? Yeah. By, the time I, by the time I got to know John Paul, he was already in decline, heavily in decline, and could, okay. he couldn't speak so clearly. Okay. Now, I didn't, I didn't really answer your question about Our Lady, did I? Um, how, the That's place. Good. Go on. Did, did you want me to address that? Yeah, yeah, that'd be, that, that'd be great. For me, it was quite simple. My conversion was first to, I mean, Christ was always uh, the center of my life, or at least I claimed he was the center of my life, and I wanted him to be the center of my life. And when I understood that the Catholic Church is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the only church that fulfills all these four notes, these four marks um, perfectly. Um, you know, everything fell into place. I thought, goodness, well, she is the Church of Christ. And therefore, what the Catholic Church teaches officially is true, even if I don't get it, even if I don't understand it. So, you know, sort of dogmatic difficulties or problems in uh, moral theology that I might not have understood at the time, for example, say contraception or something. I remember thinking, well, I don't understand why the church teaches it, but I know the church is Christ's church. Therefore, she must be right. And one day I will understand it. But I know she can't 
teach something wrong and she can't be wrong on this. And um, I'll, I'll take her word for it for the time being until I understand it myself, you know? So that was my approach at the time of this conversion. So this, something similar would have applied to Our Lady initially. You know, I thought, gosh, you know, Jesus gave her to us to be our mother. Therefore, it is important um, that she be in our lives since God desires this for us. That was my beginning. And um, when I was 18, still in, uh, in school, in sixth form, upper sixth, uh, there was a Catholic group that used to meet every morning and pray the rosary. And, you know, in lower sixth, I was joining the, the evangelicals and praying with them, you know, every morning. Uh, and it was this Buddhist girl I knew. She said, oh, come, let's, let's go to the Catholics. You know, they pray the rosary. It's fantastic. So I, I was a bit intrigued why a Buddhist would be interested in the rosary. And I went along and uh, that's where I really got to dive into my faith, not just at the intellectual level, but at the level of prayer. Because through, through the rosary, through meditating on the mysteries of Christ, through the eyes of Mary, you come to a completely different place, uh, a really intimate relationship with Jesus. And that's what drew me in and also it, and drew me to Mary. I, I began to love Mary hugely, tremendously. I was uh, utterly devoted to her. And at that time, at the age of 18, um, my godmother, she's not actually my godmother in terms of baptism. She's my Chinese godmother, we, my kaima, as we say in Chinese. Okay. And she gave me this book uh, of um, Saint Louis Marie de Montfort, you know, the yeah. true devotion. And I read that and I thought I've got to do this. So I did, I, I'd made my 33 day consecration for the first time then at the age of 18. Um, and I just, I was so delighted, you know, to hand everything over to Mary, you know, cause those are the words, right? That all, all the, all your, all your merits and all these other things you hand over to her for her to dispose of as she, Sees fit, yeah. and to bring it to Jesus. Maybe I, I also felt a little bit of guilt for ignoring her for, for those years in, in my teenage years, you know? So I think I was eager to sort of make up for that, but really I fell in love with Mary is how I would describe it. One of the pilgrims said that to me a few years ago. She said, You're, you fell in love with Mary. And I think that there's a lot of truth in that. Now, I don't want it to sound weird, but yeah, it's like, uh yeah it's like i mean if i say no other woman could have a role in my life then it sounds like a married man can't have a devotion to mary that's nonsense absolute yeah. nonsense but she became dearer to me than my own mother yeah uh, uh, yes yeah and uh yeah i love her dearly yeah and look i i i get that like because i'm i'm a married man um I spent a, num uh, a number of years in seminary discerning priesthood and obviously after I left, um, uh, met my wife, uh, we got married in 2017 and we now have uh, three daughters and yet for me as a married man and as a father, I know like that in order for, in order for me to love my children and to love my wife as to, to the utmost of my ability, I need to have God number one um and in my life it was our lady brought me to god brought me closer brought me back to the faith so once i have god number one and that you know even our lady is the number one lady uh in my life i know then that i can love my wife as more than i could ever do on my own without god and the same with my children so god in number one place then my wife then my children so in some way, I understand what you're what you're saying there when you're saying that, you know, there's no other woman in your life, but you don't want to turn uh, any married person off and say, no, you can't kind of devotion to our lady. But no, I, I get that. It's uh, it's amazing. Just a, a few minutes ago, uh, you said you weren't too sure if, if I was taking words from your mouth from uh, previous interviews. Uh, and that question I wasn't, but this next one I was, because it was at a, a, a talk I heard you um, gave that I was at, and it struck me, and it was amazing. You know, when we are when we think of all the Marian apparitions uh, throughout the world, we, you know, whether it's going to be, uh, you know, Guadalupe or uh, Lourdes, Fatima, which was 
the you know all the, the, these improvements are Medjugorje, which is being investigated. The one thing that's the common denominator, all of them are you know all these signs and 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 uh, uh, and wonders. But in this particular talk, you said something that really always stuck with me, and it said you're not too fussed by signs um, and wonders. It's great, but sometimes. Catholics may get these a little confused, put it back the front and maybe forget where the priority goes and, and all that. Could I ask you to expand on that? Sure. Actually, the line itself comes from St. Louis de Montfort's uh, True Devotion. And it's, it's the prayer to Our Lady that occurs in the third week of the consecration. You know, um, I can't remember the exact words. I've just finished that consecration uh, <laughs> again um, four days ago, you know, on, on Candlemas on the 2nd of February, I did my consecration. Um, and it's something like, I do not look for signs or wonders or something. Do you remember? Yeah, I do, do. I do know the one. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 can't, I haven't got the book by me. It's by my bed. So I can't r read you the exact words, but it's something like that. And I, I remember praying those lines at the age of 18 and meaning it completely. Um, and then, and they've, uh, and that spirit, I think is very important. The spirit of not desiring signs and wonders, not, it's basically to put it in a nutshell, to put it in very simple terms, it's, you know, you get a Christmas present from your mom, mm -hmm. you know, do you love the present more than you love your mother? Yeah. That's it. Well, what do you want? You know, how how do you want to go about this? You want to say, oh, you know, oh, this Meccano, this is the best thing ever, <laughs> or this Skeletrix or something, you know, and, you know, and you forget your mother completely. No, uh, the, the giver matters more than the gift. In Mary's case, the gift matters more because the gift that she gives us is Jesus. But, okay, but um, signs and wonders, they can be an encouragement to our faith. But we should never confuse them with the, the giver. We shouldn't prize them over the giver. Mm -hmm. Gifts have their proper place and ordering and ranking, you know. So I know I, I do hear, I think I come across as quite negative about these things. And that's maybe partly because I, I'm just shown so many dodgy photographs as well. Okay. You know? um, and after a while, you just think, I, I don't think I could look at another photo ever again in my life. You know, <laughs> I don't know how many thousands I've seen. Um, and I know they, they probably mean something a great deal to the, the owner of the photograph. Um, so I, my thing to them is, please let it deepen your faith. It's wonderful. You know, if, if you genuinely believe this is a sign from God, fantastic. But therefore, act on it, you know. Make sure you become a saint from now on, you know, live your life completely for Jesus and Mary and for no other. That's what I would want to say, you know, rather than um, because what I want people to avoid is just treating Medjugorje as a kind of um, a spiritual spa. You know, you go along and you have the spiritual equivalent of a head massage and I don't know, get your, your toenails done and whatever. I don't know what they do in spars. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm betraying my ignorance. But, you know, uh, like the spiritual version of that and then go home feeling a little refreshed. That's not that's not the point of Medjugorje. Yeah. So I lead um, a men's prayer group in Ireland, actually, <laughs> through, <laughs> social, through social media. And... Um, we began last year at the, at the beginning of the whole lockdown. Um, I was in quarantine. I just come back from Trinidad um, the day before St. Patrick's Day. I, I just managed to, to get past the Bosnian Herzegovinian border okay. and come back here. And then, but I was quarantined for two weeks in, in somewhere between the two hills. And um, you know, in. And it was my birthday. I spent my birthday in, in quarantine. And I'd been praying about this thing for a few months. And I, I started this prayer group up. And, you know, I was trying to slowly lead them into um, the, the, the spirituality of Medjugorje, the so-called five stones. And one of the things is, is fasting, you know, and I wanted to be gentle. So it, it took a while before I even got to fasting and we introduced it. And, you know, so all the lads fasted. And, uh, you know, some, some of them were saying, oh, this is amazing, Father. And one of them said, you know, this is my first time ever fasting. And I asked him, 
well, how long have you been coming to Medjugorje? And he said, 20 years. I said, well, congratulations. I said, for 20 years, you were a Medjugorje tourist. Now you're a Medjugorje pilgrim. <laughs> There's a big difference. Yeah. You know, you, you, have to, you have to enter into living what Our Lady is saying, to be a, a dutiful child of Mary, because she's asking us. She doesn't force us. She asks us to do these things. And I think we have to take her seriously. Yeah. Because that's a very valid point, because, you know, sometimes, you know, life for everybody is getting busier and busier and busier. Um, you know, it's as if there's not enough hours in the day sometimes to get things done. Um, and when we sometimes when we get a bit of time off, especially I notice at Christmas time and you don't even think that you're tired once the time you have that time off, all of a sudden this tiredness hits you and you're you're zonked. But when an opportunity comes to go to Medjugorje or go to any um, any pilgrimage site, uh, and especially if you've been there a number a number of times, you sometimes can maybe take it for granted. And once you go back, it almost becomes like obviously people come to be refreshed, but as you say, you can almost become as a tourist to go out there, have a good time in the maybe the restaurants or bars or whatever, and almost kind of forget what it's actually about, what's the point, and it's the point of uh, coming to Our Lady because she's constantly pointing us to Jesus, to the Eucharist, um, and, and, and that's a very uh, a very important point. I'm just conscious, as we're talking, I know there's going to be a lot of people listening and watching here who are pro-Medjugorje and people who are anti-Medjugorje. Mm -hmm. for, for those, regardless of whether people believe in this or not, is there a key point regarding... Our, our lady that that you that you put out there that uh, almost and I'm not even trying to categorize people, but I know there'll be people who'll be saying, "Oh yeah, look, no, I believe or I'm open to it." Or others say, "No, I don't believe in it at all." Um, and so you know, sometimes when we don't believe in something, we might you know we, we're more we we'll tend to shun the message. But when it comes to our lady, regardless whether we believe in the apparitions here or not. What matters most? What can we take home from uh, from devotion to Our Lady? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, we have to focus on what matters most. Things like Medjugorje falls under the category of private revelation. No Catholic, no Catholic is obliged to believe private revelation. And sometimes people get this muddled and they say, "Well, you know, Our Lady speaking to thousands of people out in the open is public." You know, nothing makes it. Nothing can nothing can change Medjugorje to become public revelation. Uh, public revelation is what Jesus gave the apostles. Uh, and with the death of the last apostle, public revelation is closed. No one can add to it or subtract from it. And that is the, well, we call it the sacred deposit of faith. It's, it's the Catholic faith handed down to us from the apostles down to our time. And this is what every Catholic is obliged to believe. Okay? Private revelation is any apparition of Jesus, Mary, or the saints, or an angel. Um, and whatever it says, it cannot add to our faith. Um, it can't teach us anything new. It can only remind us of things that are, you know, given to us by Jesus through the apostles. It can only remind us of what we're supposed to believe anyway. So, for example, you know, the revelations to St. Faustina about divine mercy. But we've always known Jesus is divine mercy. You know, there's nothing new in that devotion. Except the call to remember that really he is divine mercy and that after this time of mercy, a time of justice, divine justice is coming, for example. You know, and about the reality of hell and all those parts of St. Faustina's uh, revelations that a lot of people forget, you know, she, it was to remind people of this reality. The same thing with Lourdes and Fatima. Well, Fatima, a bit more obvious, you know, all the things that the children were shown and told. Don't tell us anything new with regard to what to believe. They reinforce the faith, remind us of what we're supposed to be doing. You know, we should be doing penances, making sacrifices. You know, uh, what happened to Friday abstinence? It went out the window. OK, but. When the bishops relaxed Friday abstinence, they said, but you have to find something and give that up and make a sacrifice on Fridays. How many people do that? You know? yeah. so, so 
these things are reminding us of what we're meant to do anyway. So in that sense, no one is obliged to believe any private revelation, even those approved by the church, such as Lourdes and Fatima. I think something would be lost if we did not actually believe in Lourdes and Fatima, seeing that Holy Mother Church has not only approved it, but given them both uh, liturgical memorials in the calendar. You know, I, I think it would be a bit strange um, not to believe it as a Catholic. But certainly no Catholic is obliged to believe the, the contents uh, of Lords and Fatima and the alleged words of Our Lady to the visionaries there. And again, I think even though we're not obliged, I think something would be lost if we didn't pay attention to her. So the same would apply to Medjugorje and even more so because Medjugorje has not, not been approved um, and not been disapproved of either. But, yeah. you know, not if I say not yet approved, it sounds like I'm anticipating that it will be approved. Who knows? Only God knows. Um, and when the time is right, it will be either approved or, or utterly discredited or whatever. But what matters is the Catholic faith. That is what matters. And Jesus and our relationship with Jesus. So that's what I would say to people, whether they're pro Medjugorje or against it. Um, I don't care. Be pro Jesus. Be pro Holy Mother Church and, uh, and be faithful to the true faith. That's what that's what really matters. And live, uh, live a life that shows that you are living the true faith. You know, not just have orthodoxy intellectually, but also orthopraxy, you know, in how you live, uh, that you're behaving well as yeah. far as the Holy Spirit is concerned and guiding you. And forgive me for, again, taking words from your mouth, but it was one of the reasons I asked you to do this interview because I, I listened to uh, one particular talk on you by you on Our Lady and it, I just thought it was fantastic but one point you made was re regardless of whether people believe in whether Our Lady's appearing here there or not the one thing that is key for them to believe is that Our Lady loves us as her true mother I just thought that was that that point when I heard it coming from your mouth it just struck me there was something about that just really hit me I thought it was that was powerful yeah, I was, uh, when you said that, I was wishing I knew, I, I wish I knew which talk it was, so I could just play that now <laughs> and <laughs> not bother speaking. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I do recall saying that. I think the context of that was, um, I, I share, I sometimes share with people some part of my own experiences here, which is, and I can't deny it, I did see, um, a young girl on, on this mountain, the, the mountain, not that you can see, but it's the mountain behind me, cross mountain here, um, back in 1991 when I was 20 years old, you know, and um, uh, a, a young girl made of orange golden light and beautiful, absolutely beautiful, uh, from four till six in the morning on the 11th of September, 1991. And shortly after, in the, on the, in the same morning in, in the church, when I went to the church, I heard a voice speak to me. Uh, now, I, I'm not very thrilled by these stories. I, I mean, I'm not thrilled to recount these stories because okay. you're, you're, you're already putting yourself in the category of, uh, you know, possibly bonkers kind of people. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Saying, oh, yeah, by the way, I saw a lady and I spoke to her, you know, and, uh, and I don't blame people for not believing me. Um, no one is obliged to believe me. I might be lying. I might be a crook. I might be um, an attention-seeking mad person. So you know, all sorts of. Uh, it could be all sorts of nasty reasons behind my telling such a story. Uh, so no one is obliged to believe me. But the reason I tell people that story is I I tell them I that the most important thing that I want them to believe, because she told me uh, she told me to say this. Uh, is I want you to believe that Our Lady loves you, that she looks at you like you're the only person in the whole universe, like you are absolutely marvelous and gorgeous and amazing. This is how she looks at you, that she looks at you like she's excited, like she's been waiting her whole life for this moment, because that's how she looked at me, and that's how she made me feel. And um, when I say this, I'm not saying this is not some sort of you know, kind of liberal theology, you know, you're all wonderful as you are and you're amazing. <laughs> Not at all. 
I'm just saying that this is how she loves you. And if she loves us like this, you know, how must God love us? Mm. Now, the importance of this is because God is madly in love with us. Really, when we're faced with such love, then re the only response is surrender and say, I'm not doing things my own way anymore. I, you know, I am so done with all that, with all my own nonsense. I've had it because I, <laughs> I haven't made any success of this at all. In fact, a complete hash. And it's about time I, I surrender. That's the to in the face of so much love. That's that's what we we need to do, and that is the important part, you know. So it's not important that uh, that I claim to have seen a young girl made of orange golden light, and then claim to have, to have spoken to uh, uh, a voice inside me who, who said that she was the mother of God and my mother. That's how she introduced herself. That's not important. Maybe I was mad. Maybe I was on drugs. Maybe I was uh, imagining things, or maybe I'm a liar. I don't know. You know, you could say all of these things. That doesn't matter. But what matters is the Catholic faith and the, and that God and Our Lady love us so much, so powerfully. And really, when you experience that love, you you do you want to change. You do, you can't go back. You don't want to go back to all the nonsense from before. Yeah, I no, would like I people to exper to experience that. I want everyone to experience that. You know, and you don't need to have an apparition happen to you <laughs> for that to happen. In fact, it's better if you don't have an apparition. I mean that sincerely. Yeah. I think I don't think anyone should desire to to see such signs and wonders. I, I know it might sound like people might think, "Oh, that's all right for you to say because you saw her." No, uh, I don't. I don't think people understand what they're saying when they say that. No, it's it, it, it's amazing um, when you say that. Now, I've like that's that's a special uh, experience of you i've never had uh, a, an apparition of our lady but blessed one, are you more blessed <laughs> to believe without seeing <laughs> one of the most i suppose almost life changing um occurrences or moments in my life funny enough was on top of cross mountain uh, a good uh, a good few years ago and i had the opportunity it was well over it must have been 10 12 years ago and i had the opportunity to just spend um a few months out of medjugorje uh just working on a particular project for uh, an irish priest um and at the time i was discerning entering seminary and it was supposed to ha happen that coming september so i was out there from the month of april uh, up until uh, august and it was coming uh, the time was coming and coming and coming, but I'd kind of, um, I was kind of rushing myself into it. And that whole summer, just the lack of peace was gone for me. I was just putting myself under this unbelievable pressure. And I got to, it got to a, a, a stage, I remember it was around the month of July, where I just even couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't eat, even though I've overcome that proper, pro, uh, problem easily enough, and if you see the size of my stomach, but I was just, you know, I get so ner nervous and that, and I was all cut up. I remember one night lying on my bed, and I had the curtains open, and I was looking out across the hills, and at night time, of course, the statue over in Apparition Hill is all lit up, um, and something just urged me, it was about, about half three, four in the morning, said, get up, and climb cross mountain because the house where i was staying was just underneath the mountain uh and i was thinking to myself i was almost having a debate myself saying not a chance it's four o'clock why are we doing it that time but yet i found myself getting out of bed dressing myself i looked at the mountain it was pitch black uh no lighting at all and yet over the next qu three quarters of an hour an hour i just i made my way up and uh saying a, a brief prayer at each of the stations of the cross all the way up and i got to the to the foot of the cross on top of the mountain and i sat on the little wall around the base of the of the cross uh for about um for about three quarters of an hour and i remember just at the moment um uh, i was i was praying the rosary uh praying the joyful mysteries I remember praying the joyful mysteries just slowly and halfway through at that moment the sun started coming up at the other side of medjugorje and it was just as if the whole everything stayed just went still and this 
weight just came off my shoulders. It was unbelievable. And I didn't hear or see anything, but it was like somebody in my voice was just, just saying, slow down, take it easy and just take a step back, take a step back from everything. Um, and now <laughs> people are saying, gosh, even listening, saying, look, I could have told you that in five minutes. You didn't have to go to the Medjugorje to hear that. But it was just something, you know, when you're having this constant turmoil in yourself and your heart and your mind. And uh, this, I just nearly skipped down the mountain that night, uh, that morning as the sun came up and it just completely changed me. Now, as it turned out, uh, gave myself an extra few years, went in the seminary a few years later, spent three there's years there best experience of my life without a doubt um and now look i'm 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 here in ireland married uh with children but without a doubt fantastic all all that experience was absolutely key and i wouldn't change it for anything um because in it uh i just felt our lady was bringing me closer and closer to god and just really teaching me that surrender that just let go and surrender completely over to god now that was a that was a very simple personal experience um and that but it's just when you're talking about cross mountain there i was like oh yeah i've i've experienced on top of that mountain it's it, it, it's been amazing but prior just a while ago uh in this uh chat you spoke just briefly about one of the five stones of medjugorje which was uh <laughs> fasting um i just want to focus on those a little bit uh, at the moment. What are these five stones uh, of Medjugorje and why are they called stones? You know, so often you hear things go, oh, these are pillars or whatever, but in Medjugorje, you, you hear them uh, described as stones. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the early days of Medjugorje to the period around 1982 to 87 where all these different priests were trying to summarize the spirituality of Medjugorje. And they were coming up with these short lists, you know, they're saying things like uh, obvious, obvious things like prayer, peace, fasting, you know, and, they, they, and these lists were kind of problematic. You know, once you say something like peace, well, peace is not exactly an activity, you know, <laughs> you know, you can't go around to say, go around and tell people, be more peaceful, you know, <laughs> well, what do I do? How do I start? So they were really unsuccessful. And Father Yozo um, Zovko, who was the parish priest here when the phenomenon of Medjugorje first began, now he'd been um, he'd been in prison. The communists put him in prison. After that, he was more or less exiled. You know, he was in different places. Um, I think he was living in well, it doesn't matter where he was living, but a few miles out from Medjugorje, and the pilgrims used to go and see him. So I think in the period around 1986, 87. He came up with a list of five items, five practical things to do, which summed up a spirituality of Medjugorje. Um, whether this came to him from an apparition of Our Lady or not, he's never confirmed or denied. Uh, it seems that he also has seen Our Lady at least on one occasion. But he used to make these little prayer cards with a picture of Our Lady on it. And this was the, oh yeah, he was in a place called Tihalina, which is about 20, 30 minutes away from here. And the stat, he just took the picture of the statue that was there and put it on these cards. And on the back, he put the five stones. Uh, and this went with the pilgrims. And so that image of Our Lady is now, most people think of it as Our Lady of Medjugorje. It's not. It's uh, Our Lady of Tihalina. And it, the statue was bought in Italy as well, you know, but it's, it's the one that's most linked with Medjugorje. Yeah. So he came up with these five stones and he said, he puts, the, it's as though Our Lady speaking, the way he phrased it, where Our Lady says, I give you these five stones against your Goliath. Um, so she means like the way David, the shepherd, goes to meet Goliath and he takes five smooth pebbles from the stream and his slingshot, you know, he leaves behind all the armor and the weapons that King Saul had given him, you know, the kind of, which symbolized the human means. Um, for combat, for a spiritual combat. And he takes what uh, God wants him to have. And this, so this is, uh, these are weapons that Our Lady gives us in our spiritual combat against Goliath, whatever Goliath might be, all, our, all the difficulties that we encounter. So this is where the idea of the five stones come from. So the first stone is 
Now, the first stone itself is, is split into two. It says prayer with the heart dash rosary. Yeah. Okay. So pray with the heart. To do things with the heart is something that Our Lady has spoken of here over and over again. She keeps saying, please pray with the heart, fast with the heart, attend mass with the heart, confess from the heart, for example. you know. So by prayer with the heart, she seems to mean Pray and mean your prayers. Don't just say the words. You know, don't just rattle through the rosary and saying all the words. Uh, meditate on the mysteries. Slow down. So, for example, today is the first Saturday of the month. Yeah. Um, and Our Lady, when she gave the, the, the first Saturday devotion to Sister Lucia of Fatima, one of the conditions is, uh, you know, you have confession, communion, and number three is to pray the rosary while meditating on the mysteries of the rosary for at least 15 minutes. Yeah. I used to wonder why did she say for at least 15 minutes, you know, uh, and quite simply, like when you pray five decades, maybe the minimum time you should take is 15 minutes, you know, because if you're, if you're doing it faster than 15 minutes, you're probably praying it too fast. Uh, and I, you also, just I, also, I often wonder, uh, does she have the Irish in, in mind when she said that? Because <laughs> for, Whenever, like, it's a very common practice in a lot of parishes here for rules to be said before and after Mass, but sometimes when I've gone to certain parishes and trying to join in, I think I'd have, I'd have more energy left over if I'm running on a treadmill because it, you, it can be rattle, rattle. And, and the people, the, the people, um, they, they're so well-intentioned and they, uh, and they mean the best, but, you know, it's so easy to pay lip service to prayer or to the rosary and yet our mind could be off somewhere uh, yeah. somewhere else where you know our lady wants us to enter into prayer with our whole being with her our mind our body our soul everything and uh, um yeah it's an important point i know my, my parents uh when they prayed the rosary together i mean they they used to do it every night until my father went into a nursing home because he has dementia but until that point you see he because he's terribly deaf <laughs> before my mom had finished the, the first part of the Hail Mary, he would jump right in with the Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. <laughs> and that used to really annoy <laughs> and annoy me as well. <laughs> but, but yeah, and I and I think I remember experiencing that in Ireland as well in many parishes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that they wouldn't wait. They would just jump in with the Holy Mary and um, and kind of rush it as well. Well, I think that's universal, not just in Ireland, but... Anyway, but yeah, so Our Lady wants us to slow down, to pray the rosary from the heart in this sense. And to meditate, you know, to really, to put yourself in the mysteries, make it personal. Um, you're never going to exhaust the mysteries of the rosary because, because they're mysteries, by definition, they're inexhaustible. And really, it's, it's we're, we're kind of superimposing our life on the life of Jesus, seen through Mary's eyes. You know, and the two, till the two become indistinguishable in some way. Because, you know, we are tempted otherwise to think that um, the events of our lives are the most important. And they're not. <laughs> really, they're not. You know, it's, it, it's, it's a strange thing that, you know, you can be praying the sorrowful mysteries when you're actually happy. You could be praying the joyful mysteries when you're actually sad and depressed or something, you know, but... But that's the point. No matter how we feel, we're plugging into something higher than us, you know, into a higher reality, into into higher truths, into the source of grace. Because all the great cause his passion and all the mysteries of Christ's life. So that's what the rosary is. And Our Lady wants us to pray this from the heart. The second stone is. Um, now I've forgotten the order. <laughs> uh, the mass, is it? Oh, yes, of course it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a bit rusty. <laughs> Don't worry, I let that part out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the mass. Now, she said quite a number of things about the mass. She said, um, understand what a great grace the mass is. You know, come early to mass. Prepare in silence before mass. Let the priest prepare in silence in the sacristy before Mass. She knows the priest too well. Uh, yeah. ne never leave Mass without making your thanksgiving. Mm. You know, so, and, and uh, in the early days, actually, I mean, she did, she did tell the, the visionaries off 
as well, you know. She told off Maria, Maria on one occasion. She said, oh, you would have done better to go to Mass and not waste time gossiping with your friends. <laughs> you know? oh, you know, uh, and she also said those who habitually come to late to mass, it's better for them not to bother coming. Because well, why does she say use such strong language? Well, basically, if you you know you're, if you're habitually late, it means you're basically saying I don't really care about Jesus all that much. Yeah, and I I also don't get it. You know, ever since I came back to the faith and understood that it's really Jesus in the Eucharist, I think. Well, why would you not want to receive him? Yeah, you know I. Why would you not want to go to confession and get yourself prepared to meet Jesus? Why would you not come to Mass early to prepare? Because you can't just waltz into Mass and and then go up and receive Jesus. It doesn't, it, it's not right. You know, your your mind, is your spirit, and you're not calmed down enough. You're not prepared spiritually to receive him yet. And it's the most exciting part of my life, uh, and certainly of the day. Why would I not want to be prepared for that? And also, why would I want to be in a rush to leave after? Because exactly. Jesus is st still inside me, you know, and um, I want to spend those precious moments with him. So that's always struck me as odd. And of course, you get lots of Catholics who, who don't know that. I mean, maybe they, they know it as a theory or they know the words. Um, intellectually, they understand, yes, to Jesus. But maybe in the heart, they don't quite believe it or haven't really uh, received it. Yeah. So going to Mass is a chore or something boring or just something to be done. And um, they can't wait for Mass to be over so they can run out because it's far more exciting to sit outside and have a coffee or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, so a lady wants us to take the Mass seriously. And she says, go to Mass as often as you can. And yeah. certainly, certainly in Sunday Mass. I mean, you can't miss Sunday Mass. Um, this, uh, uh, I mean, for me, the, my problem is I understand that uh, as something normal. I've never ever, um, until I came to me, until I was ordained a priest, I never really, I know this sounds odd, I never really encountered a, someone who might call themselves a practicing Catholic who didn't necessarily bother with Sunday Mass. Because I thought, I knew, you know, they're lapsed Catholics, they don't go to Sunday Mass. Fine, I understand that. But someone who claims to be practicing, who doesn't really bother going to Sunday Mass regularly, to me, it makes absolutely no sense. It's a bit like saying, Oh, yes, I'm a committed husband. Um, some years I celebrate my wife's birthday. You know, <laughs> well, you know, you're not a committed husband at all. <laughs> you know, if you don't celebrate your wife's birthday every year, <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Then the third stone is Bible, Holy Bible. She said, now she said this here at a time when possessing the Bible could get you in trouble. She said, put the Bible in a prominent place in your family house. Let everyone read from it, even the little children. Read oh. especially the Gospels. Memorize it, root it in your heart and live by it. You know, so she meant like, you know, whatever you're reading that day, try and read it again and memorize it. Let it sink into your heart, almost like Lexio Divina sort of thing, yeah. you know, um, and live by it through the whole day. Um, so again, I think you know Catholics were a bit um, were a bit hopeless when it comes to the Bible. Yeah. You know, I, I think a lot of Catholics aren't even entirely certain what books are in the Bible or not. Yeah. You know, I remember coming across uh, someone. There's a word um, we use, um, exegesis. It means interpretation yeah. of the Bible. And this person heard the word exegesis, and she, and they were saying, Father, does that come? between Genesis and Exodus. <laughs> <laughs> <Very good. laughs> okay, so I understand. I mean, if you if you don't really have um, a framework of what's in the Bible, it's very hard to approach it. It's very hard to read it if it hasn't got um, kind of even guidelines within the Bible, like, you know. So it, it's difficult, actually, to recommend a decent Catholic Bible. I think the... Uh, the Didache Bible by uh, Opus Dei, you know, the... Um, yeah, so, it's... Uh, I actually have it, I have a copy of it right here. It's. Uh, I'll put it up on screen there, actually, for the viewers. It's absolutely amazing because um, the, the commentaries at the end of each of them are based on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, is that the one you're thinking of? Yes, that's yeah, one. That's, that's a really... That I would recommend. I mean, the 
let me think. Um, it's actually, it's an Orthodox Bible. <laughs> There's an Orthodox study Bible, and they're mostly very, very sound because they share the same faith as, as us, except on, on the Pope. So, you know, uh, and even on the papacy, you know, Matthew 16, uh, 16, they, they're not too bad. You know, they're not anti-Catholic or anything. But the rest of it, you know, it's like, it's very liturgical. It's very, the, uh, which is a very Orthodox way of looking at the faith but also very devout. And I yeah. wish there were there was a Catholic Bible more like that. Yeah, okay. But right now, I don't, I'm not sure, well, I don't know of the existence of a, a Bible like that. Yeah, there is okay. the English Standard Version ESV, which was made by Protestants, and the Indian Catholic bishops have uh, allowed it for use in the liturgy. It's a really good translation, actually. And uh, I think sometime this year it's going to be sold through Amazon to the rest of us as well. Okay, wow. So, but I hope someone makes like a Catholic study Bible with that text, you know, it's, but something along the lines of what the Orthodox have already done for themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't know why Catholics can't get their act together and make a, a decent devotional kind of Bible, you know? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's the Bible. I've had a little rant at Catholic Bibles. But, <laughs> yeah, get uh, one of the things I used to use with my university students was um, I had a comic book Bible, which I where I had when I was a child. Um, and it's called, I think it's called the Illustrated Bible. Okay. Uh, made by Protestants in England, of all places. I, I always thought it was an American thing. And the drawings were very much in the style of these 1950s you know, sword and sandals kind of movies, you know? Hey. So I loved it because I grew up watching, you know, Ben-Hur and The Robe and all those <laughs> kind of movies, all those films. And uh, and that gives you a really good framework because you you know which books are in which order and what in the Bible. And, and, um, and those more recent versions of that, they even address the books that the Protestants don't use. They call them the but they're uh, the Catholic, but they even into you know a little nod in that direction, and I, I don't think it's a bad idea to do that with young adults, you know, um, or yeah, or even older adults. Because maybe maybe they do. I, that's not the important point, but I think as a as a it's something that you can see two or three days, and then you'd have a really good sense of what's actually in the Bible. Okay. And it, make, wow. it makes it approaching the scriptures a lot easier, I think, after that. Wow. Excellent. That, uh, that sounds fantastic. Um, no, the, um, what I'll do is uh, in the description box below uh, here in YouTube that uh, I'll put the links to the different things here that uh, uh, people can uh, check up. So yeah. that's the, yeah, and that's the, so there are the three, three of the five stones of Medjugorje. You've, you spoke already uh, briefly on the fourth one, which is fasting. Mm -hmm. that. Okay, fasting. Now, just yesterday I was talking to someone about fasting and we were talking about how it's not necessarily obvious to Catholics now why we should fast. Um, and I was reading the, the original document way back in the 1970s when the American bishops did away with... Um, <laughs> with Friday abstinence. Um, and they basically said, look, we, we rather that everyone uh, avoided eating meat on Fridays. Um, but, you know, if you can't, then don't worry about it, but please replace it with another act of penitence. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then more recently, the English bishops reintroduced Friday abstinence. So back in England and Wales, you know, oh. we we don't eat meat on Fridays again, you know, but in some ways it's a bit like shutting the barn door after the horse is bolted, yeah. you know, <laughs> because you have a whole generation not used to it, but no, but you know, so we, we need a lot of catechesis, catechesis to get people used to the idea again yeah, and used to doing it. And of course, in the old days, I remember people would complain and say, well, what's the point of this? You know, I can go and have lobster thermidor on Fridays. Well, yes, you could, but that wouldn't be in the spirit of Friday abstinence. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so, okay, fasting in Medjugorje, the way Our Lady has phrased it is she says fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. And she even says the best fast is on bread and water. Okay, and she says that she needs our fasts in order to be able to convert people. 
and to bring them to Jesus. This is exactly what she said at Fatima as well. She said, um, today more souls go to hell because not enough people pray and make sacrifices for them. So it's in line with what she said at Fatima. Now, fasting, of course, Wednesday and Friday, it struck people as a bit odd, but this is actually an ancient Christian tradition and all the Eastern Orthodox and the Eastern Catholics still keep Wednesday and Friday fasts. It goes back to the apostles, you know, we're like one of the earliest documents, the Didache, you know, you showed me the Didache Bible, but the, the original Didache, the teaching of the 12 apostles, which is possibly written somewhere between the year 80, 50 and 120, somewhere in that period. It says, you shall not fast with the hypocrites they fast on Mondays and Thursdays. That's the Pharisees. The Pharisees fast Mondays and Thursdays. It says, you shall fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Okay? And then a couple of centuries later, we get uh, also among early Christian documents, we have explanations why Wednesday and Friday. Wednesday was the day the early Christians believed Judas went to the high priests and said, what will you give me if I hand him over to you? And Friday, of course, is the day of Jesus' suffering and death. Yeah. So on these two days, Christians fasted. Um, and, and, and this was in, in all our cultures as Catholics, you know, and I, I, I pointed out that, you know, the Irish words for Wednesday, Jehadian means day of the first fast. That's right. And Friday, yeah. Jehinia means day yeah. of the, uh, well, day of the last fast was the original name. Um, and of course, uh, Thursday, Jardin, the day between the two fasts. <laughs> oh, yeah, they did Jardin. Wow, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it was there. Um and it, this was what the ordinary people did, not just the monks. Everyone did this, you know. In Icelandic, what is it? Friday is fast to talk or, uh, fasting day, you know. Oh, okay. So it used to be there. So Our Lady is really just calling us back to what we used to do anyway. Um, and really, I think we're not so good at fasting. You know, in the in the in the modern church, we have. Ash Wednesday and Good Friday are the two days of compulsory fasting. And even then, you know, you can have one full meal and then two small <laughs> meals, yeah. which together don't add up to a full meal. You know, when I explained this to one of my Jewish friends, he said, oh, you you Catholics, when you say fasting, you mean you don't eat in between meals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, fasting does have a great deal of power. You know, it 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 frees us. We're so used to thinking, I think, of our suffering, you know, oh, I get headaches, I get, uh, I get tired, I can't do anything. Well, when I go to the gym um, for the first time, I get headaches, I get aches, I get pains, and a great reluctance to go. But if I go there regularly, I actually look forward to going to the gym, yeah. you know, and then it becomes much easier. And I think we need to get through that wall, you know, we have to keep fasting till it actually becomes a bit easier. I mean, it's never going to be easy. The point of it is that it's a difficulty that we accept out of love, love for yeah. Christ. But um, without fasting, it's very difficult, I think, to live the Christian life, honestly, without fasting. Because Jesus says, you know, when I'm taken away, then my disciples will fast. Yeah. And also he says, some kind of demons cannot come out except through prayer and fasting. That's right. You know, and I think... When you see what fasting does for us, you know, I remember when I st started fasting years ago, when I, you know, through my conversion through, through Medjugorje at the age of 18, at first, okay, I was really eager. And when, you, when you're young and eager, it's easy enough to do. And I didn't think twice. And then later on, I started to feel sorry for myself. You know, I'd see other people eating and think, oh, I don't have the freedom to eat. But really... I know I see it in different terms now. I just see it that I've chosen to feast. By fasting, I'm actually feasting on Jesus. You know, I'm going to what's really important to me. And I'm doing it out of love for him, not for boasting or for any other reason. But also when you fast, you, you, you have more peace within yourself, more control over yourself, over your temper, over, over your appetites, over all sorts of things, you know. And um, and yeah, it's it's a it's a beautiful thing. It's always easier if everyone fasts. But yeah. um, here in Medjugorje, I remember one of the early messages that Our Lady gave. She said, "Many of you are fasting only because everyone else is doing it." And she said, "I want you to fast out of love for Jesus. Fast from the heart." It's almost like what Mother Teresa said was, "Love till it hurts." 
uh, and in some way I always associate that uh, myself when I think of fasting like what you were saying there a while ago that you know when we started we can you know it, it, it can hurt but anything that's worthwhile hurts because it takes work uh, and all that and and we're, we're yeah we're called to love till it hurts one comment I heard before from Father Slavko regarding prayer and fasting uh, I thought was amazing and my wife and I have uh, spoken about it uh, before in a number of conversations where I remember he he was saying is when you when you pray without fasting or fasting fast without prayer it's like to it's like trying to run a race on one leg but when you're when you're fasting and prayer you're 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 using both legs and you can you can take off so to speak and uh when I heard that, I was like, wow, that was one of the best ways I've ever heard it put. It was fantastic. Yeah, it's true. It's yeah, true. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful way of seeing it because yeah. we need both, really, um, yeah. because one without the other would just is, is hamstrung. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And so that's leading us on so, to the final stone of Medjugorje, which is confession and of course Medjugorje is known as the confessional of uh, of the world and for anyone who's been out there particularly when it comes to evening time uh from from maybe er, uh, late afternoon early evening right on to the night you can see thousands of people all around the whole perimeter of the uh of the church queuing for confession and queuing for hours and hours and I suppose it's one of the hallmarks so to speak of Medjugorje what it's really really known for uh, and this is a very very important stone for our lady yes it is it is she said many times she said confess your sins humbly contritely you know and confess all of them leave it all with Jesus she says things like uh, you know confess your sins and leave them behind you and look forward only to Jesus and walk to him do not look back you know yeah. I think confession is something that many people find difficult naturally they're reluctant to confess or they they're worried about how well okay first of all it's, it's difficult to even confess certain things to yourself <laughs> let alone to another person uh to admit wrongdoing to, to admit sin and then to admit it to another person you know and wonder oh you know i'm going to be judged and how they look at me or they might share it or they'll give me a dirty look the next time they see me or something like that um and maybe maybe one reason they feel a little bit more freedom is they think, well, I'll never see this priest again. <laughs> so I'll confess to him here in Medjugorje. You know, you, you might get some a priest from Omaha or something, you know, and you confess to him and, and that's it and never cross paths. Maybe that's one reason. But I think it's also a grace given to people to actually confess. Because before coming to Medjugorje to live here, I think if I heard someone say they hadn't been to confession in 30 or 40 years, I would have been really excited and astounded, you know. Uh, now, I mean, Medjugorje, to hear 50 years, 60 years, is kind of normal. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> you know, uh, yeah, it, it's not it's not extraordinary, let's put it that way, yeah. you know. And I, I, I often joke with them and say, you know, don't leave it another 50 years, will you? <laughs> yeah. It's amazing, though, isn't it? It's like when... You know, when you we hear so many stories of the amount of people going to confession out there, where the the gap between their last confession is massive. Because sometimes people might get into their mind is, I have been it's been so long since I've been to confession, since I received the, received the sacrament of reconciliation, that you know it's going to look so bad. I can't even go back. I can't go back now. I'll just I'll just leave it be. But you know what? It doesn't make a difference if it's been a hundred years. Go make the most of it. Um, mm. and, and and it's like anything in life. Sometimes when we when we're really nervous and anxious about something, we build it up to be a lot more in our mind than uh, than it really is. And for 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 the most part, when we come across priests uh, in any confession box throughout the world, and especially out there in Medjugorje, you kind of realize. How easy was that? And yeah. what a weight off her chest, off her shoulders. And you know what? What what I had built it up to be in my mind, it wasn't like that in reality at all. Yes, yes. I think, you know, even though confession is a is a supernatural sacrament, yeah. I think even at the natural level, there's a deep need in us to confess, you know, isn't it? It's, I think it's one of the 12 steps for Alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, complete 
disclosure, something like that, to to okay. at least one person. I think this is something that every human being desires. You know, we we think, wouldn't it be fantastic if there was at least one person in the whole world who knew everything about me and still yeah. loved me? Yeah. You know, uh, and most people don't have this because um, they're so worried that they'll be rejected, that they uh, keep things secret, even from their spouse. You know, they're, they're too ashamed or whatever it is, you know, and and they've never really talked to these things out, never expressed it. We have that need at a natural level. Uh, so when it comes to a supernatural level, you know, you don't just get to express these things, but you also get God's forgiveness. You know, you get God's love lavished upon you, in you. One thing people need to realize, you know, is that as soon, you, you might think, um, well, you know, will God forgive me? Will I forgive myself? This and that, you know. But really, instead of worrying about these things, you just have to ask yourself, do I actually have a desire in me to confess? You know, even the slightest desire. And if there is that desire, then you have to know, as every good Dominican, every Thomas knows, it means God is already forgiving you. <laughs> you know, his prevenient grace is already forgiving you and drawing you to the sacrament. And therefore, you should not be afraid of confession. I um, try to think, I've never really been afraid of confession. I've had many good confessions. I'm talking about myself as a penitent. I've had a couple of bad confessions. I left really angry with the priest, you know, thinking, oh dear, <laughs> I'm never going to him again. Um, and, uh, and, and stuck by that, you know, I'm, Maybe that priest had a bad day or maybe, I don't know, whatever. Maybe there was some reason. But I, you might think he didn't listen, to, uh, didn't listen to you properly or didn't really hear what you're saying or whatever. I don't know. But um, I've had lots of good experiences in confession. Um, I don't think I've ever been frightened of it, apart from my very first confession. <laughs> my very first one, I knelt in front of the priest. It was this 70-year-old French priest. Uh, this is back in Singapore. And I found I couldn't open my mouth and I couldn't say anything. So he, he just sighed deeply and he absolved me. <laughs> so my second confession, <laughs> which was maybe two years later or three years. Uh, and that only happened because my mom said to me, so when did you last go to confession? I said, well, my first confession, that, that was my last one. <laughs> and she was horrified. So she, she sent me to the confessional. Uh, so I think I must have been about nine or ten years old. I didn't know what to do. So this is my second confession. And I went to the priest and I said, uh, my last confession was when I first went, you know, just before my first Holy Communion. And I didn't say anything because I didn't know what to say. <laughs> so, But he was really nice. And so the second confession was a beautiful experience at the age of nine or ten. <laughs> That's very good. It's actually a, a very important point because, you know, maybe sometimes people might have had a really bad um experience the confession and put them off uh and like the message to get out there is look if you've had a really really bad e experience the confession don't let that put you off the sacrament go again go again to a different priest um if, if need be because the majority of priests are so loving and kind but i suppose at the same time uh, you know on the on the other side of the coin it's very important that we're not trying to search around for priests as well that will tell us what we want to hear um as well which is sometimes is sometimes the trap we can uh, fall into you say well if i confess this sin, i know that priest from previous experience doesn't really say anything so i'll go to him instead and i'll only go to him and no one else but uh it, but if, if someone has had a really like for example i, I said I was, I was a seminarian for three years and two of those were in rome uh and i won't say the, the order or the basilica but there was one particular uh priest and the first time i went to him i was like oh and he started shouting and roaring and anyone that knows uh the confessions in uh in rome generally the it's like a half hatch where the priest is sitting inside and you can look outside and, and i was like oh my gosh and i was trying to think when i was re repeating what i said and i was like what did he think i said and i was saying did it, did it rhyme with something and then afterwards when i was coming out he was doing the exact same to the pit, and every time over the two years to come back, this guy would be shouting and roaring at people. And I was thinking, 
Oh my oh, god! So like this is they, but yet yeah, that was like those experiences were few and far between. Um, and, yeah, actually, and, my, my bad experiences of confession were in Rome mostly. Yeah, <laughs> that's for my part as well. Yeah. yeah. So after a while, I I got fed up, and I used to go to Saint Mary Majors, where it's the Dominicans now. Not because they're my own order, but there was an Australian priest there, Father Kieran, and he was lovely, and I I used to go and confess to him. Yeah. You know, yeah. because I got fed up of going to St. Peter's or St. John Lateran and, you know, and have a priest um, treat you badly or something. You know, I thought I'm not, I've had enough of that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually St. Mary Majors where I used to go then as well as that. There was a lovely Polish priest um, who would really, very strict, but would really keep you on the straight and narrow. And he was English speaking and uh, no, it was, it was, it was fantastic. But uh, no, that's, that's, that that's interesting. So um yeah so i guess before we finish up is there anything else you want to add for leon well i think just a little bit more on confession i want okay. to encourage your your hearers your listeners this is a podcast is it are they going to see my face well viewers and listeners yeah. to not be afraid of confession yeah. you know that uh, and not to worry about what the priest thinks of you or things like that you know the priest's opinion of you is completely irrelevant you're there to confess to jesus and uh, you might get, sometimes you get people saying things like, oh, you know, why should I confess to the priests? You know, they're all sinners and, you know, with all the, the, the pedophile scandals and this and that, uh, I'm not going. And uh, at some level, I understand that. But I'd say, look, at least be honest with yourself. You know, yeah. uh, um, don't, don't latch on to any convenient excuse to explain your behavior. You know, if you're really so disgusted by pedophilia you don't want anything to do with the priests be consistent you know don't watch any pro programs on rte because uh, they're full of pedophiles don't ever call upon the guards because they're full of pedophiles don't ever watch a hollywood film they're loaded with pedophiles okay be consistent don't be a hypocrite <laughs> okay that's what i would say to those people <laughs> but really and I think it's because they're, they're just latching on to any, any old excuse. Um, and the real reason is they're afraid. You know, they're afraid that what will happen if I'm honest with myself? Uh, my whole world will collapse. And then really, I'd say pray and look inside your heart and see that this unconfessed sin is what is destroying your life. You know, because you're so afraid that if you let it out, your whole world will collapse. Where actually, whereas actually, the truth is, you will be set free by Jesus's power and grace, um, and that you don't have to be afraid of Jesus. You know, He's calling you, so come to Him. That's that's amazing. That's, that's really beautiful. It's uh, uh, it's amazing. So, like, when, when even when you look at these five stones of of magic or is given by Our Lady, like everything is pointing back to Jesus. Uh, and everything is, you know, on the outside, you might look at it, go, gosh, there's a lot of work in that, but it's for our ultimate good. Uh, our lady wants us to experience eternal, eternal salvation, eternal eternity with, with Jesus uh, in heaven. And she's pointing the way she's pointing to the path that we're to follow to, uh, to, to do that. And, and, and she'll always encourage, encourage without ever, ever interfering with our free will. But encouraging us like a like any mother, any beautiful mother do. So it's it's amazing. It's really a it's really a message of love, really, isn't it? Yeah. And the five stones, you know, live them out of love. They're yeah. they're about living a, in a relationship with Jesus. They're not about keeping rules and regulations. It's not like that at all. It's you know returning to the sacramental life. Basically, it's what Holy Mother Church wants for us for our conversion. If you look up the catechism under conversion, you'll basically you'll find the five stones there but not yeah. called the five stones, but they're yeah. listed there anyway. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Father Leon, I promised to keep you an hour, and I'm seeing there it's an hour and a half already, so mea culpa, my no, uh, no, sincere no, apologies. Father, Leon, I re uh, uh, Father Leon, I was going call you Father Yunan. Father Leon, I, uh, I really, really appreciate you giving your time. I know you're a, uh, such a busy man and, um, and that, and you have your own ministry as well uh, out there. So before we finish, can I just ask you to lead us in a, in a closing prayer? Sure, of course. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this, the grace of speaking and pondering. 
the mystery of Medjugorje, but more deeply through Medjugorje, looking at your son Jesus, your great gift to us. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit moving in our hearts. Uh, and among all those who are listening to this, we ask you, Father, you, by the Holy Spirit, call your children to yourself, unite them firmly with yourself and let them experience your love for them deeply, a love that calls them to surrender everything and to trust you completely. We ask all of this in Jesus' name through the intercession of Our Lady. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father for Leon. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me.